Are they safe? Nobody safe. Nobody safe. All right, we are here again with Chi Van Fleet. This is the second of a three-part series we were going to do in regards to Mao um, and how it started with uh, land reform, and then we went into and an ending in cultural revolution. Uh, but this is the second part that we're going to talk about, and we're going to kind of dive into what happened before the cultural revolution. So, uh, Xi, how's it going? Okay, good, good. I'm so glad to be back with you. I'm glad to have you. You're becoming famous here. You've been on Fox News and all these other places. I'm glad I, that you're still talking to the little people down here. No, I, 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 I'm glad you're getting your no, word out, too. So it's very important that other people are hearing it in other platforms. But I, I do appreciate yes. you coming back and doing this with me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have an important topic to, tar to talk about today, which is kind of the middle. So we went over the land reform, and then the next one is the culture revolution. But... <laughs> This one we're kind of talking about is something different. What are we kind of talking about here? It's, uh, you know, the, great, the story of the Great Famine that people know very little about. Right. And this happened, and, and some of the issues that the reason we've, I'm bringing this up and I'm doing this series is a lot of the um, ways and manipulation that, was, that Mao did, we start to see that happening here. Um, in the United States in regards to everything from um, uh, cr uh, cr critical race theory and, and topics like that, a lot of that manipulation and that propaganda is happening here. So I, I want everybody to kind of know the story of this so that when they see it happening, they can be like, uh-oh, uh, and know kind of the outcome of this, which was not a very good outcome, was it? That is the key. So the reason so so committed to um, educate uh, American people of the evil of communism is they don't know. They need to know what had happened to China, to other communist countries. So when it happened here, which is happening right now, and people will recognize it because they have the knowledge. And so many of the things we're going to talk about is happening here. It's just a variation of the same thing. And that's history is so important. If we don't know it, we're going to just doom to repeat it. Right. And, and, and that's why history, I've always said this, hint, history gives context to the things that are happening today. Right? You, yes. If you know the history, yes. then you understand the context to, the, to, to today and what could happen in the future. So when we yeah. moved from the land reform, we saw that the um, Mao came in and basically took the land from, you know, from the rich and gave it to the poor. And then he decided that, well, that's not good enough. And then he took it from them <laughs> and gave it to the, basically to the state. Now, yeah. what they did after that was, was kind of the next step of their, of what they considered their process of breaking people. Um, yeah. And here, go yeah. Ahead. can I just start with uh, kind of, I, I uh, go uh, chronologically. Yeah. So the uh, group, uh, the land reform was uh, the uh, um, one of the uh, first uh, campaign. And then they took the land from the uh, rich and killed many of the rich. And then another important thing to remember land reforms from that time on. Chinese people were divided and labeled. And the label uh, um, designate you, um, you start, uh, you, you, uh, um, 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 you state in the, uh, no, you statue in the society. Right. You are either black enemy or you're red, the allies. And that went on until the cultural revolution. So, uh, along with the land reform, the, um, the CCP also, uh, launched many, many other campaigns from 1950 to 1955. Most of them were targeted on uh, what they consider um, possible resistance or potential enemies. And they killed many, many of the defectors from the nationalist army. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and call them either counter-revolutionaries or hidden counter-revolutionaries. By the end of 1955, millions of their potential enemies were killed. Of course, 
including the landowners and some of the factory owners. Right. Okay. So Mao think, um, yeah, this is all good. Yeah. All the enemies are gone. So um, he feel like uh, he should be able to focus, uh, change the focus to probably economic development. And mm. that was uh, 1956. Something major happened in the communist world. The famous uprising against the government in Hungary. And of course, it was brutally crushed by the Soviet troops. And that kind of uh, shook Mao. He said, you know, kind of, how could that happen? You know, he said, his conclusion was, they did not kill enough of those potential enemies. And he was very confident that what happened in Hungary would never happen in China. And he probably was right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but he, uh, that still kind of uh, uh, alerted him that uh, you cannot take it for granted. Even if your enemies are all gone or killed, you still have to be on the guard. So he feel like uh, he needs to strengthen the CCP. And by what? He came up with this idea by letting other people outside the party to give communist um, parties suggestions to help them to, um, you know, uh, make the party more fe more effective. So he launched this famous Let 100 Flower Bloom campaign. And right. you know that, right? Right. And you mentioned, yeah. So and it sounds very good. Yeah, and, but the issue was, too, is that he wanted people to write letters and he wanted people to say how to make the government better. But back then, not a lot of Chinese people could read and write, correct? Oh, that here is basically intellectuals. Right. So he so basically went after the... Who would say anything? It's intellectuals. The intellectuals. So they thought Mao was sincere. Mao probably was. So they started to make suggestions. I thought they were make some kind of a minor suggestions and whatever. No, they are raising very, very serious issues. Issues such as free speech, such as free uh, uh, expression and uh, free press and power sharing. Oh, no, no, no. Power sharing with uh, communism? With communism? No way. So after a little while, Mao realize no this this intellectual should be dealt with so from that point on that become a conspiracy he encouraged he encouraged all level of uh, the party to encourage the intellectuals to express the idea to let themselves expose themselves mm. and well you know intellectuals they're just not politically savvy and then, of course, they don't know enough of the evil of the Communist Party. So, they, yeah, they continue and then uh, said a lot of things, and then including a lot of students, college students. And Mao turned this from let 100 flower bloom to anti-whitest campaign. Crush, crush, with no mercy. So many people affected. A lot of the college students were labeled um, rightist. You're not just get a label, you're exiled. Right. Um, most of them were exiled to places like uh, on the desert area in the south, uh, in the uh, uh, north, northwest, and uh, many, many of them perished. So, what is the significance of that campaign was everybody learned. Don't tell the truth. Mm. You cannot tell the truth. Truth will cost you life. So that is the significance of that campaign. Do you feel and was, not Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Do you feel it was a way to separate? Because obviously, you know, teachers today and the stuff that we're going with the school board today and things that were happening. Do you feel it was a way to separate the outspoken teachers to the non-outspoken ones and put all of the teachers in line with what he wanted? Well, just think about it. And you can you can imply, yes, that the way they say, uh, get rid of this uh, anti-vaxxers. 
that's a way to identify, right? It's an easy way to identify. And uh, um, so, yeah, that's an old trick. So let those people talk, and then you identify, they expose themselves, and then all you do is gather them, and, uh, and, and it's just deal with them. So not only that, from that time on, everybody learned, don't speak the truth, don't speak up, period. Right. But also, lie will get you, um, uh, lie will um, get you to places that you want to. And so lies were encouraged. So remember this, without this, the next disaster would not happen. Okay, so that's uh, 1956 to 1957. Seven. Yep. And then they got rid of all the... Uh, uh, outspoken people. So now everyone is a yes man now. Right. So in 1958 to 1956, uh, 19, uh, 1960, Mao launched this uh, so called People's Commune and a Great, great Leap Forward campaign. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, this is two, but they're together. They, 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 they are launched at the same time, but I have to talk about them separately. Okay. First is the People's Commune. Remember that the land reform, the land was given to peasants, given to individuals. So everyone had the same amount of uh, uh, land, right? It's uh, equality, no, it's equity. Well, that was uh, uh, 52. Now it's 58. How many years? Six years. Now, Mao wants all the land back. Right. To the state. So that's what the commu uh, People's Commune campaign is about. This collectivization of everything. Everything. I'm not talking about just land. Land for sure. So when they started the great, uh, the People's Commune, and as I tweeted, that's where you found me, mm -hmm. that they promised the heaven. They promised the heaven. This is the greatest thing. Don't think that you lose your land. You gain the land because all the land is yours now. But of course it's a lie. When the land is everybody's, no, it's nobody's land. Right. So they have this commune. So now the rural areas were divided into communes, different communes. And under commune, there was a big production team, and then smaller production team. And that's the structure. And that's where I worked for three years, from 1975 to 1978. So, so go ahead. And in the, in the nine, uh, 80s, it was uh, dissolved. Right. That just <laughs> did not work. So they divided the land, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, rural, area, rural areas by communes. Everything, everyone owns everything. So the land goes back to the state and your food going back to the commune. And it's called um, everything, the, 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 the promise, uh, the, uh, the peasants, you don't need your little uh, kitchen. We're going to have this communal dining. We'll get all people's uh, our food together. We'll share. And then the government will promise everything. Will promise free. I, I can't even remember the 10 free. Uh, free food, free lodging, free education, free uh, even free haircut. All good. It's all good. So people's uh, food were collectivized, all gathered together by the commune, by the what's called the big communal dining. You do not, you need your uh, own kitchen. Actually, people who resisted, their walks or stoves were smashed. No, everyone now go to uh, the commune dining hall and eat collectively. And in the very beginning, there was, of course, a lot of propaganda, pictures of people being happy, and you can eat all you want. And they even invite people, passerby, come, free food, everything. <laughs> and uh, the food was consumed, like gone in months. And uh, so there's no food. 
And meanwhile, the peasants' lives are collectivized. I don't know whether I use the word right, collectivized, I guess. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the peasants were organized almost like, a, uh, like an army. And uh, so they have uh, um, collective, um, or called free um, kindergarten or, or school. So, and then, and then dining was taken care of by the commune. So women, and, you know, women traditionally stay home and take care of the family and children. Now they become uh, the labor force because there is nothing to do at home. Everything was done by the state by the commune. So this is, I really want to make this a kind of a, a point for people to understand. Yeah. Sounds like um, people, it sounds like, uh, oh, the, uh, the women were liberated. Sure. No, oh. they were enslaved. They had to work side by side with men. No option of uh, staying home. The home is wrecked. And then the, uh, the, uh, there's no home. <laughs> the uh, the communist uh, party and uh, and said family is not needed, so they destroyed the family or at least attempted to do that. So the people were working almost like a slaves on the plantation. Right. They like um, in the morning there will be someone um, uh, wake them up. They go to the dining hall eat. They go to the field work until dawn uh, until dusk. And it's just, I just, there's no other way to describe it, but uh, 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 slavery on the plantation. So, and so this is commune. Okay. So, and, uh, and then uh, the cadre, the people that are in charge of all this started to lie to the, uh, to their boss to, you know, say that we're doing so well. Our production has improved so much. You know, we're used to every uh, acre produce this much. Now we produce double. And then someone else on the, in another commune said, double? We produce triple. And then it's the lie just compounded. They're just lies were just, just obviously kind of like absurd, some quadruple. And um, people still wonder, did Mao really believe it? Here is something to, to know. The scientists also join the lie. Those are the intellectuals. They know that you will uh, benefit by lying. They say, yes, it is possible and whatever. So it's like uh, everything looks just so incredibly rosy, right? But by the time you come to collect the, um, the grain, you said you produce quadruple, and then you have to turn it to the state. Right. See what happened? And this is the starting point of the famine, that the food was all gone, taken away by the state, because it did not produce that much. But they had to give away so much. Meanwhile. Okay, go ahead. So, and, and I wanted to bring this book because this makes a good point because you, just like you said, they, they weren't liberated. They were, they were put into basically women were sent to go to work. And, and, and we realize that women who stay home and help raise their children, the, ch the children get a better education and do better. But this was the kind of the start of that mentality that go to work next to your husbands, go to work with the men and do that. But they, because they, they couldn't stay home. They didn't have that option to stay home. They do not. Right. Okay. So, meanwhile, um, okay, he had this ambition. Just by sheer determination and manpower, he was going to surpass, uh, su surpass Great Britain and the United States in 15 years. By mm. what? By steel production. He's not interested in improve the economy that will help uh, better the lives of ordinary people. He was only interested in steel production because that's where you get your steel to produce weapons, right? Right. Okay. So he wants this to be a mass movement 
to make steel. Of course, they have some steel factories, but that's not enough. Mao's style is mass campaign. So everyone got involved in making steel, including the peasants, including the students, including the people living in urban areas. They all have to do this. So what they do, they have the homemade uh, uh, furnaces mm -hmm. and they have to go to the hill to find some uh, um, to find some uh, iron iron ore what do you call it yeah iron ore yeah <laughs> it's not just anywhere right right <laughs> so they could not find it so what they do they started to encourage people to donate everything that they can find at home doorknobs a key knock, anything, pots, pants, anything that's made of uh, iron mm -hmm. to donate so that they can make it into um, steel because it was like a the quota. Every uh, commune would have to turn in this much and it's just absolutely insane that people even get the nails out of their um, household somewhere and to to put uh, that into the furnace so that they can produce steel. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah, just absolutely insanity. But people did it because that's mouth water. So when everybody was doing steel making, of course, most of them came out useless. Right. Most of them. Because they meanwhile they were farmers. They were farmers. Yeah. Or just ordinary. Uh, or ordinary uh, people. Uh, yeah. People. Yeah. So meanwhile, the farm work was neglected. There's nobody, only the old people and some, probably some children. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the crops were just there, no one to harvest because they had this quota to finish for the state. And um, that was another reason for the famine. So when the uh, crop got rotten in the field and then the state have to collect so much grain because just stated, you know, the country said, we produce this much and that is a disaster. Right. So from uh, 1959, to 1961, up to 15 million people died. And uh, in my province, uh, Sichuan province, and uh, about 8 million people died. And, um, and then there's uh, cannibalism. Cannibalism, I'm sorry. Right, cannibalism, cannibalism yep. And uh, there were even stories of uh, um, uh, children were uh, in and then was chopped up and sold as meat um, on the market. It's just absolutely horrible. Of course, I was too young to remember, but I do hear from my parents. They're in the city. Few people died in the city, mm -hmm. even though they went hungry. And uh, so everyone was swollen because they don't have enough and they have to eat a lot of those. Uh, um, there's one vegetable, and I think it's in the char family, the kind of a colorful um, uh, vegetable, leafy vegetable. It's in that family, and they have very thick stain, and that was easy to grow and grow fast. A lot of people depend on eating uh, that as the main food, and, uh, and then the result is everyone is swollen. And uh, the ration is so little that everyone is hungry, but the people who died were the peasants. And uh, there are stories of people were buried, and then next day, someone dig it, dug it up and just eat the corpse. Wow. It's <laughs> just, just horrific. And this is not knowing. This is the biggest famine in human history, I bet majority of the um, Americans don't know. Yeah. And the, the young people in China, they don't know. 
because they were not taught. And, uh, and the uh, CCP covered everything up. And even when I growing up, all I heard is the great, uh, no, the three-year natural disaster. That's how they call it. Three-year natural disaster. You, you know how big mm. China is. Yeah. There's never such a thing that a natural disa- disaster hits the whole country. Even right. if there's some that hit a region here, a region there, right? Right. No, nope. they just, uh, yep, uh, that's the uh, natural disaster, nothing to do with the CCP. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, there's some people died, but it's the natural disaster. And um, you can look at the pictures of Mao during that time. He mm-hmm. was fat. Yes. He was not a small guy. <laughs> he was not no. a small guy. And he told people, he, he, he gave people instructions on how to uh, deal with this uh, so-called food shortage. Mm-hmm. He said, well, you know, eat solid food during the busy season, the busy agriculture season, right. and eat just soupy food in slow season. And he was reported giving up on eating meat. Right. He, he ate fish instead. This is just, uh, yeah, this only happened in a communist country where that um, people were not allowed to leave their village. They were not allowed to leave their village. And, um, and before they, um, if this happened in the, you know, original famine, whatever, people were allowed to move around, maybe go to somewhere else in the city or do some uh, begging and maybe they can survive. No, they were not allowed. So there's no picture. There's no photo. During that time period, you mm. could not find any photo of people starving because it's all controlled. Right. And, uh, and this is just incredible. This is the biggest crime that the CCP committed. How did and you- I have friends. Go ahead. Okay. I was lucky because uh, my father and my both parents a cadre, and I was, uh, they were able to enroll me into a kindergarten that food was guaranteed. So there's never equity. People don't think that communist country is equity. No. I had the privilege, even though I was very little, I was in, uh, put in the kindergarten that was basically um, 24-6, not 7. I do have, I did have a day like uh, Saturday, Sunday, I can go. Uh, I could. Uh, um, my parents could pick me up, and and uh, so it's like a, almost like an orphanage. But I had enough to eat. I have friends here that I met that talking about the fact that, that um, to their body, there is a uh, my uh, one of my friends said um, until she was like a three, she was about the same age as mm-hmm. I. She could not. She could not support her head. Because she was so weak, so the, her 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 neck is just so weak that uh, you know up to three she could not, you know, her, stand straight with uh, her uh, head on her sh- on her shoulder. She, that, that has to be supported, and it's still uh, and some of the people um, like uh, the young girls uh, did not have period until like thirteen or fourteen mm-hmm. um, because of the um, uh, malnutrition. Right. And uh, it affects you. It affects you. And then, uh, later in life, you probably say all sorts of things that all because of the uh, childhood malnutrition. And um, so anyway, so that is uh, the uh, um, the disaster. And of course, meanwhile, this is something, again, I want to just, uh, just um, um, make people aware. Communists. They don't care. They really do not care about human lives. And when people were starving and dying mm. in the millions, Mao never stopped its foreign aid to Africa, gave them food, because he needs his African bodies to be his followers so he can be considered a world leader in the communist world. Mm. Like, so let me ask this, like, how did your, and you, your parents probably told you stories, but how were they surviving during this time? Like, uh, what were they, I mean, they, they had to work basically making, you know, well, steel also, or like, what, 
What was their role? Yes, they did. They all because they're in the city. It's not uh, all a full time uh, job, but they have to go and support those uh, um, uh, in the commune to support. Yes, and um, they just uh, had um, not enough food to eat. They they just went hungry, but they were not starving. Um, so I, and I remember my neighbor. She told me this story. And uh, so she was in college during that time. Mm-hmm. And so when she went home, her her uh, home, you know, I think the food probably is better than the cafeteria in school. So her parents said, what, 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 what do you want to eat? She said, I want to drink lard. Yeah. Yeah. So you may have some grain, but you don't have anything else. And that gave, I really remember that story. I, I could imagine you have so little to eat and no, no protein. Right. All he wanted, what she wanted was a drinking lard. Right. Of course, they, they probably did not even have that much lard. Right. Uh, um, yeah. So, um, so that is uh, the, uh, um, that's the, uh, the, the famine. And uh, after that, and uh, the, uh, the communist um, party, they have to do some uh, reflection. This is not a small um, uh, thing that you can just let go without uh, deal with it. So um, they had a um, uh, uh, party had a conference, and in that conference, as they said there were seven uh, attendees, and Mao did criti- uh, did do some so called self criticism. Mm. So admit mm. that. Uh, there are some issues, yeah, that we probably, uh, there are some policy problems. And after that, he was uh, um, put on the uh, back seat. And um, his uh, um, uh, president, Liu Shaoqi, and uh, we're going to talk about him uh, uh, during the Cultural Revolution episode. Right. And Deng Xiaoping, who was the reformer, they were in charge. Of course, their focus at that time is to do what? To improve the economy so that, so that uh, you know, get rid of the, uh, um, um, the, uh, uh, some of the dra- um, uh, radical policies and uh, um, let uh, the peasants have some little land that they can at least cultivate for their own family. Um, so that's when uh, uh, Mao realized that, hmm. I, I, I'm losing power, I'm losing prestige in the party, and uh, I have to do something. And uh, that's his le- next step. Right. And I want to go back real quick, too, because you went to what, you know, what we call kindergarten. Um, and how many people, like, were parents basically trying to get those kids into kindergarten just so they could eat? Because that seemed like oh. a way to, to keep control of people. Would be to well, and uh, that is uh, uh, the kindergarten I was able to go is the only few. Very few. I was so lucky. I was so lucky. I w- it's only a few. Most people going hungry, but at least they were not starving to death. Right. Yeah. So from that point, now you. Your parents are basically, they're trying to make, obviously, steal like everybody else. What would happen, I mean, the quotas that they would have to reach quotas, like who was coming in and, and kind of checking the quotas? The, the, the whole town or like, or, or village, I mean? This is uh, something that people have no idea. The communists, the communists, they perfected the way of control. Control every individual. They have uh, layers of uh, bureaucracy that absolutely no one can escape. Now, uh, they have a central uh, government, provincial, county, commune, production uh, team, and small production every level, totally controlled. So, yeah, they have uh, the code probably is from the, uh, and the, the code is from the central government and go down in every um, level until it reach to every individual. No one. No one can escape. Everyone has to get involved. And at that point, you know, they just saw what happened with, you know, the 100 Flowers campaign and stuff that nobody wants to complain at this point or escape because 
those people get marched off and never come back. Those people are killed, basically. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, we'll see that. Um, we will see uh, and, and, and in the next episode about cultural revolution. And uh, actually, a lot of the people that suffered took the cultural revolution as an opportunity to take revenge of those cadres that pushed those um, policies. Mm. That is that is something people need to know. Communism is a meat grinder. It is absolutely no one to escape. It's the uh, the people that fight against this, and then the other group of empowered by this. It's never, never ending. And those people, those countries, carry on the. Uh, well, they not only carry on, they exaggerate it just because they want to uh, prove that they were uh, the winners of this competition, whatever. Um, but they were carrying out the policies set by the central government mm -hmm. and those people, every one of them, every one of them will be the target of the wrath of the uh, people and the Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution. Right. Because it's amazing Including, if you think... Including, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing if you think about that. He got the whole country. And and even then, it, I can't, I you know, you still had quite a lot of people in China. I think still like, you know, a billion people. But he got the whole country to stop farming and make steel. I mean. That is the, the, the control is incredible. Incredible. That's, I, I don't know what I said in the last time. They, after the, uh, um, uh, land reform, and then they also have the similar uh, reform in the city. Everybody gets stuck. You have a label, whether you're black class or red class, you also have to register for your residence. You can't, movement, freedom of movement was no more. Mm. <coughs> so you, you basically stayed in that I'm going to say village, uh, but you basically had to stay oh, yeah. in that village. And the only people that could probably move from that village would be the, the people that were coming in to check the quota and take the stuff back to the States. The, oh, yeah. The only thing where well, they have a place that they belong to, the only people that can um, relocate mm -hmm. is women who marry to another villager in another um, village. Mm. That's the only way. That's the only way. You cannot move in the city. It's even worse. Because your, uh, your lodging was provided by the state. Like a, my family, we have one and a half room for a family of five. And you sound, that sounds kind of bad, right? One and a half room. Right. And we share a kitchen with four family. That was a luxury. Because the other family is one room for multi three generations. One room. So everything's controlled. Food is controlled. Rations, con uh, uh, everything's rationed. You, there's no freedom of movement whatsoever. So everyone starts, so no one can escape. That's why they can control everybody. Never happened in China, in the history of China. That you just stuck there, right? That's absolutely amazing. I mean, if you think about that, the size of the country, the the the, the amount of people in the country, and they were able to be controlled in that matter is is actually amazing. If you think about it, no. Let me tell you now. Okay, I just had an interview this morning with Fox News yeah. about what's going on in China. That a lot of people who uh, deposit their money, mm -hmm. entrusted their hard-earned money in the community banks. Mm -hmm. And then, since April, they were told, no money to withdraw. You can't withdraw money. Okay, during the COVID, um, the uh, government, during the COVID, the government required that everyone ha um, get a COVID passport, and uh, there's a green code, meaning uh, when, when your code is green, you're uh, negative. Mm -hmm. 
when your code is red, you're positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So since April, people were not able to withdraw money from the bank. Mm. Those people who went to the bank and demand that they want to withdraw their money, their code turned red. Wow. (laughs) So basically... That locked them in to that they couldn't even get to the bank to take their money out because they were code. It was a code red. They could not even leave their home if your code is red. So now, with the uh, technologies, they cannot just control you. They control your movement. Right. They can disable your code, and you are stuck. If you co- uh, if you leave your home, you will be arrested. <laughs> right. <coughs> That's China. And that's where, 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 that's where we want to go. And I just want to wake people up. Right. See what people do in China with uh, uh, COVID passport. Mm-hmm. They can do the same here. They absolutely can do the same here. Yeah, and I, I, I normally say one of the reasons why communism uh, failed was be- because they couldn't reach out and touch everybody, right? They couldn't reach out and control everybody. Well, with technology, they, they, they literally can control everybody. And now that they can, if we let them, they will. They will. They are to. doing it. They right. are absolutely doing it. So if, you are in, uh, if you, they identify you as a dissident, all they do is turn your uh, uh, COVID uh, app red. You are not allowed to go anywhere. Not even a grocery store. That's what they're doing. So the control is not loosened. The control is worse than ever before. Thank God they stole all the technology from the U.S. and they are doing it with evil. Right. Yeah, a hundred percent. And 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 from there, after you know, the next step is what they did during the Cultural Revolution and how they turned people against people and 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 um, to just enforce it to try to enforce it even more. And we're reaching that point. We are. So I always want to remind people, when you listen to all this uh, history, um, just don't think it's something happened long ago in a foreign land. All this either is happening here or could happen here. Right. And and a good thing, too, and I want people to understand is the reason why we're doing this in a three-step thing is none of this happened overnight. It, it was something that exactly. happened over years. So it's a, And it was a slow-moving process that... It, it, you can almost see that happening now, right? They don't want it to happen too quick because if it happens too quick, people will kick back, right? But it's, yeah. a, it's mm-hmm. a slow moving process. And if we don't stop it, if we don't see it coming, it will happen here. It will. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, and I, that, that's the whole purpose of what doing this podcast is to educate people. Right. And, and so I, I, I want to thank you for coming on. I know you've already done you know, your, the other interviews today, so I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do appreciate you coming on and talking about this. Um, and the next one, you know, we'll take a little break on this one. And then the next one will be the cultural revolution. And some of that, you were actually, you were there to witness a lot yeah. of that. That I witnessed and experienced. Right. Everything. Else. Yeah. So that one, I'm very excited to talk with you about because I, 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 people need to hear that because that is being played out every day <laughs> that I turn on yeah. the news. I literally see a lot of that happening um, as we speak today. I mean, it's yeah, it's yeah. from the schooling yeah. to the separations to the you know youngsters coming out, you know, younger young adults and stuff coming out and going against authority. It, it is literally being pushed today, in my opinion. Yes, yeah. This is uh, um, the uh, this episode and the last one was more. To educate people the evil of communism and some of the things that that led to the Cultural Revolution, but the Cultural Revolution is what's happening today. Right. It is a cultural revolution. Wokeness is a cultural revolution, and what we're fighting is a culture war. Right. And 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 it's being done because we don't have the history and the context of the podcast we're yes. doing here, and that's why we yes. did. The, we started with the land reform. Uh, we moved into the hundred year, you know, flower campaign, and we moved into the famine. 
And, you know, when, when it comes to, and, and we're even moving, you know, today we're even talking about having food shortages and stuff. And from there yeah. comes control, you know, yeah. I mean, and, and so it, the next it's, it's an extremely, you know, easy to see, unfortunately, but scary event that we could be leading into. So yeah. I want to thank you again for coming on. Is there anything you want to say uh, just before we head off? I think we covered a lot. We did. Thank you so much. No, no, thank you so much. Like I said, and, and for everybody out there, as I always say, stay safe, stage out.